Hello and welcome to the West London Sport YouTube channel. I'm Dan Bennett. I'm joined today by Ben Kosky and Ian McCullough to chat QPR, who beat Huddersfield Town 1-0 yesterday to make it back-to-back -back wins in the Championship, lifted themselves up to fourth in the table. Um, Ian, there was a kind of sense going into the game, despite it only being November, that it was quite a big game. I mean, Huddersfield, obviously, just outside the playoff places going into it. And after the win, it, there was a real sense that it was quite a big result, despite it being quite early on in the season. Did you kind of get that, um, that sense? Yeah, definitely at the end. I think the results kind of went Rangers' way the night before. Um, and also last night, Stoke losing to Bristol City. Um, obviously, the big result in terms of the, the kind of the makeup of the top six. And, um, you know, Huddersfield, they just come off the back of an excellent win against uh, West Brom. And um, I thought it was a really good game, actually. Really, really enjoyable game to watch. Two teams that really had a go. And um, the second half will keep you really good. Probably best performance probably since they beat Middlesbrough back in August. Um, I thought they really had a go and um, great to see Luke Amos score. And um, yeah, up to 19 games played up to fourth is a, a lot, a lot, a lot of football to be played between now and May. But, you know, given the players they're missing and, you know, where they were 12 months ago, it's a, a you know, a real, a real sign of progress. It's, a, you know, been a great start to the season. Absolutely. It's looking very good. Probably, not long after this last year, we probably had a chat in about how bad the, the team was doing and Mark Warburton's job being under threat. So like you say, how big it's, how much it's changed in the year is pretty remarkable. Um, ben Ian touched on it there about Luke Amos. Obviously, his injury problems have been well documented. He had the ACL injury when he was still at Spurs. Then he came to QPR and got another ACL injury. So he's come back from two and he's, I'm not sure how old he is, but he's still early 20s. So to come back from both of those and to score last night, it was a great moment, wasn't it? After some great work from uh, from Chris Willock as well, who looks to be in top form. But, um, I mean, you sort of spoke to him, didn't you, leading up to the game as well. So it must have been pretty special for him, I think, to uh, to get that winner. Yeah, without a doubt, Dan. I mean, um, I mean, one of the things he, he said said to me was that, obviously, it's been a very difficult year for, for Luke Amos. And, and one of the things he, he said was he felt felt bad in a way that, that, that he felt like he hadn't contributed anything to the club in that time. Um, and, and he described uh, when he came back against Everton in the cup game and, and ended up taking a penalty, you know, the relief when, when he put the penalty away and he felt like I've finally contributed something uh, for the first time in a long while. So he would have been feeling that probably 10 times, I think, after scoring the, the winner against Huddersfield. Um, and, and I think everyone around the ground was just... So delighted for him. It's, it's, it's great to see. Um, and, you know, what, what a crucial goal it could be. I mean, as, uh, as Ian said, it was, it was one of those games where I think Rangers' performance, I, I would agree, was, was certainly one of the best we've seen in, um, in, in, in quite a few months. And, and you just felt, really, that there's a goal coming. You know, they've just got to be patient. They've got to keep doing what they're doing. And, and there will be a chance they, they you know, they can sort of put this away I suppose a little bit like the home game against Blackburn not that long ago where they also scored the only goal um, chair scoring late on and, and they've just managed to close out the game which which is really encouraging again against a side that was sort of right to, right behind them in, in the table and um, uh, and as, as you said Dan yeah fantastic for, for, for Luke Amos uh, he, he would have felt about um, 20 feet tall I think after seeing that hit the back of the net and um, you know great uh, great great feeling really for, for everyone around the club when, when something like that happens yeah it was a huge result it's like the, you look back at these tight games all being well come the end of the season has been so important I think this all being well and they, they do make the playoffs come to the end, end of the year this will definitely be one you look back on and say how big that was hopefully I'm not jinxing it too much there but um, I've got some uh, bit of transfer news as well uh, QPR looking to sign in uh, Tottenham youngster Rafferty Pedder who's on trial at the club uh, contracts up at the end of the year seems to be a bit of a trend here recently with I mean not just Tottenham youngsters but kind of these academy guys in general that aren't wanted by their clubs and QPR kind of snap them up and try and develop them a bit of a new focus compared to what it's been um, in previous years when it was more, you know, more focused on big money signings when QPR are in the Premier League. I mean, you, you a fan of this strategy and you enjoy what QPR are doing in the transfer market with this kind of business? Um, I think it's a bit of a case of needs must, really. You know, the, the best young players 
you know, sort of seven, eight, nine, ten years of age, you know, hoovered up by the likes of Tottenham, Chelsea, Arsenal. So all these players are well known to academy coaches, you know, around London. It's a pretty small, small pond, um, you know, the academy level. Everyone knows each other and everyone knows the players. So, you know, the, it's a well-trodden path from, you know, Tottenham to QPR. You know, the likes of Mas Luongo, Luke Amos, you mentioned Grant Hall, Joe Lumley, Charlie Owens, they've all kind of made the way, you know, from not indirectly from Spurs in, in some cases like Luongo, but um, to QPR. And, you know, when it works, it's worked well, not necessarily with them. Um, those guys I've mentioned, but, you know, the likes of, you know, Biri Eze and Ilias Chair and Sini Dieng that have been picked up because they haven't made it at other clubs and, you know, cultivated at QPR and turned into good, you know, or in the case of Eze, outstanding first team players and then sold on for, you know, big profits. So they'll be hoping that Rafty Pedder can be the latest one they bring in and um, if they do sign him and um, put him in the first team and, you know, make him a, you know, a regular contributor to the first team picture. But it's a long way from that. At the minute, he he is on trial. Um, I'm not going to lie; I don't know much about him. But he's a he's a centre midfielder, mm. and um, you know, as you mentioned, he's out of contract Spurs at the end of end of the season. So they they do this quite often. They 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 take a player who's uh, Aramidiote was one that did this. He wasn't going to be given a contract, and they they had him on like a work experience for want of a better phrase. Just to have a look at him, and then they and they signed him. That move didn't work out as well as you know some of the others we've mentioned. But uh, they they had a, uh, a Chelsea lad, um, uh, Taylor Crossdale, who mm. um, was at Fulham after turning down a Chelsea uh, con uh, offer of a contract, and he also turned down the chance of signing with Wolfsburg. So he was very highly rated as an England under twenty uh, striker. I think he was. I think he's part of the England under nineteen team that won the World Cup. Uh, Rangers had him on trial, but you know they didn't fancy him, and he's moved on. I think he's joined a non-league team now. Um, right. So it just goes to show that players that you go really when they're twelve and thirteen don't always kick on to be, you know, what they are when they're twenty-one, twenty-two. So it's a, he said, yeah, it's a hard, hard graft being a young player. Mm. Yeah, work. It, I wish I got to do my work experience for a football <laughs> club in school. That'd have been all right. <laughs> and go into an office or whatever. Um, like Ian uh, said there, Ben, there's definitely, I suppose, from Rafferty Pedder's perspective, there's, there is a pathway there now into the first team for players like this. You know, we've seen it with so many. Obviously, Eze probably being the most eye-catching one, then getting his move to Crystal Palace. I think QPR are sort of seen as a development club now where there is that pathway into the first team, which I guess can't be said for all clubs in the championship. A lot of them still, you know, want the ready-made kind of product to challenge for promotion and QPR are challenging pr for promotion. But still sort of doing that that kind of business as well yeah i i think that's a real positive and um you know ian's mentioned some of the success stories through that pathway and uh you know if if, if you look at um, players who've been picked up from from spurs in particular and going back a few years you could add people like peter crouch and danny maddox who mm. who came through that route and, and did well at, at qpr and um and, and and this is great to see i mean as, as you said dan a lot of um, championship clubs don't seem to, uh, you know, take that uh, that that path uh, or, or that strategy. And, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago, I would have said there's no point in any young player moving to QPR because they'll never get a chance. Um, and, and that's fact. You know, that, that was borne out by um, the fact that nobody, nobody did get a chance. But then the club is run very differently now. Um, I think partly through necessity, but partly because they've realised um, th this this is what the, the club should be doing. It is all about picking up um, players from elsewhere and developing them and, and making them into first team players. That's that's what historically QPR has always done and, and done well. And um, you know, we'll we'll see if uh, Rafferty Pedder turns out to be another. I mean, as you say, there is a pathway to, to the first team. Of course, ironically, um, at the moment for central midfield players. That looks quite a long path because for the first time in a while, um, we've actually got quite a lot of competition for places now with um, with Luke Amos, Sam Field coming back from injury um, and, and competing with the likes of Johansson, Dazelle, uh, Dominic Ball. So 
which is great you know I, I think it's you know we've, we've had so many um times in in the last year or two where you, you've looked at that and thought well that that area of the team's really thin on the ground and um right now central midfield looks um i would say pretty pretty healthy so yeah but but, but good luck to him if he, if he does get taken on obviously well he's got the name for it Rafferty Pedder. I mean, he's got to make it, hasn't he? Surely. Sounds like a law firm. <laughs> yeah, I, d- I don't think it sounds like a footballer's name to me. It's a great name, uh... though. Rafferty <laughs> Pedder. I mean, it, people are going to remember him if he plays with a name like that. At least that's one good thing. But, that's yeah. true enough, but uh, we'll see how he does, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, you kind of mentioned it there, Ben, as well. It's like with the players QPR have signed as well, not necessarily the young lads they've brought through who are like, like Pedder, but even with like Dizel and Dickie and people like that that they've brought in, it's more of like a development focus, isn't it? Like Dizel's getting a lot of game time now, even though he's got a long way to go and he's not the finished article. And Dickie obviously came up as a good player from League One, but was a bit unproven in the championship. So it does seem, I think you say, needs must really, isn't it? There's not the money at the club that there once was. And even when there was and that was spent, that did not <laughs> pay off at all in most cases. So... It seems to be that the transfer strategy really they've kind of got that nailed down now. And Lyndon Dykes, another one as well, who obviously came not having played in the championship and had a tough run, but they stuck with him and now he's doing well. So all uh, all seems to be going well in the kind of the, the transfer department. I just wanted to come on to something else as well. Uh, some interesting news at the weekend involving one of QPR's players out on loan, um, Macaulay Bon, who uh, was asked about whether he wanted to come back to, to QPR or whether asked about sort of the, op, the potential of him getting recalled by QPR from his loan spell at Ipswich and sort of in no uncertain terms said that said that he didn't so got the quotes here he said at the minute I can't really say a lot but I'll say it straight I don't want them to recall me I don't want to go back and be third or fourth choice coming on for a few minutes when I'm thriving here um, said that he's found his uh, goal trail found his half a yard again and that he was sitting on the bench gaining weight eating Jaffa cakes at QPR and that he doesn't <laughs> He doesn't want to do that. Um, quite strange remarks. I mean, I don't know what you guys thought of it, but reading those, I sort of got the sense that there's a bit of frustration there from Macaulay Bond, a little bit of anger maybe towards QPR that maybe he didn't get the opportunity that he should have got last season. Um, I mean, when he did get the opportunity, obviously didn't really impress enough, missed some big chances for QPR, but kind of got the sense there was a little bit of frustration there. And, you know, it's quite... You don't always hear a player come out in that stronger term and say he doesn't want to go back to his parent club because he's doing well. Um, what are your kind of thoughts on Ian? What was said? Um, interesting comments, as you say. I do think as well when if you don't hear the audio of what he said, the context of how he yeah. said. Can, yeah, I mean, I was only reading them, so it doesn't but... translate as well into prayer. So he might have said it in a kind of half half jokingly way about jam mm. cakes. But I mean, either way, I mean, you know, from a report reporter's point of view, brilliant, great to have a player actually saying what they think instead of trotting out the yeah. old words out of my hands, you know, etc. Line. But the reality is that's what probably he should have said. Um, you know, it, it's obvious that you know, Ipswich are you know a club that shouldn't be in League One. They're a big club. He's an Ipswich boy. He's scoring goals. The fans love him. You know, it's kind of similar to what QPR fans were to towards Stefan Johansson and. Charlie Austin last year. Um, so it's understandable he wants to stay. He's scoring goals. He's happy. He's playing with his hometown team. I don't blame him. Um, and obviously, you know, he's trying to engineer some sort of move. Um, but the reality is that QPR paid, you know, from what uh, we've been told is around £2 million to, to bring him in from Charlton. So they're going to want some of that back. And Mike Warburton's line is, well, we, he's our fourth choice striker. And you know, like we did with Charlie Kilman, we'll send them out on loan to make them better. And when they come out to QPR, you know, yeah. they'll do the business for us. That's kind of where he's, that's how he looks at it. So um, I don't think they're intending on selling him. Um, there is a recall option in in January. Um, so I understand where, where Macaulay Bond's coming from. But um, I mean, at the moment, in the Dykes and Andre Gray are injured. We don't know how long for. Mm. And you know, Charlie Austin is the only kind of fit, recognised striker at the moment. If he was to, you know, injure himself at the weekend, or sorry, on Monday against Derby, then, you know, they might have no option but to call Macaulay Bond. Um, as we don't, you know, know the long-term 
injuries to the, the two players I've mentioned. So it's not really in McCauley, the ball's not really in McCauley Bond's court at the minute. So um, he might want to stay, but QBR might want to bring him back. But on the other hand, QBR might just say, well, you're scoring goals at League One level. You didn't score goals at Championship level. So stay where you are, come back to us next year and we'll take it from there. But, um, you know, but at the same time, if he's just want to come in and offer QPR the money that they paid for him, then I'd imagine, you know, I can see a deal potentially taking place. But at the moment, Macaulay Bond, you know, he doesn't really ever say where he's going to be. Mm. Yeah, so Mark Warburton said that Macaulay is our player. It's as simple as that. He's gone out on loan to play games and get experience. He said that, like you said, we've, said, we've had some injuries to our strikers. And if it's the right thing to call him back, they will do. Uh, but if it's not, they won't. And they don't want to unsettle him while he's out on loan. But QPR pay his wages and he's contracted to QPR, so we'll do what is right for QPR and, of course, what's right for Macaulay as a player. Uh, and then he made a joke about the Jaffa Cakes as well and said that he wants him for the coach's room. <laughs> um, what do you make of this, Ben? Obviously, the, the potential there that QPR could recall him, and like Ian said there, there has been some injury problems in the striker area at the moment with Lyndon Dykes out injured with no Andre Gray as well. And Macaulay Bond scored a lot of goals this year. He scored 11 in 18, I believe. Do you think they should bring him back in January? No, absolutely not. Um, I think, uh, you know, Mark, Mark Warburton has said what, what he's got to say, really, in, in, in that situation. He's, he's kind of made light of the Jaffa Cake reference. Um, he's reminded everyone that Macaulay Bond is QPR's player. But ultimately, uh, he, he will look at it and be well aware, and, and I'm sure he was aware anyway, of, of Macaulay Bond's feelings on whether he wants to come back to QPR or not. And it's clearly not going to be in the club's interest if you force a player to return to a club that he doesn't want to play for. Um, you're not going to get the best out of him. And, and my feeling is, as Ian said, I think there is a deal to be done. Um, clearly, the move to Ipswich has suited him. Um, Ipswich, you would think, will want to keep him if they can, if they can come up with the, the sort of money that... that Rangers will want for him. So I would say, from Mark Warburton's perspective, if, and, and it is a big if, because we don't know about the situation with the other strikers, um, but if they're, they're a bit thin on the ground in January, then my feeling is he would look to, to bring someone else in, um, on a whether on a loan, another loan, on a, or a permanent kind of, I suppose, Charlie Kelman type player, if, if you like, someone who's sort of young and looking to make the step up. Um, but I, I do have some sympathy with, with, with Bond as well. I think um, he makes a fair point. I, I don't feel he, he got as many opportunities as he probably should have done. He never really got a run of games. Um, and if you look at it, he, he actually, you know, I don't have the stats to hand, but he, he, he did find the net quite a few times when he actually... Uh, uh, got given opportunities as a sub, but he, probably not when he, when he started. So um, sometimes, you know, moves happen and they don't work out for, for club or player and, and you cut your losses. And, and I'm thinking this is probably one of those and there is probably a deal to be done with Ipswich somewhere down the line, whether it's January or next summer, we, we shall see. But um, personally, yeah, I, I would be very surprised if we see him again um, wearing... Uh, a Queen's Park Rangers shirt. Really? So, I I mean, that's the concern, isn't it? It's that if he doesn't want, really doesn't want to come back to QPR, like he said, then you risk bringing back an unhappy player who potentially might, I guess, unsettle the balance of the squad. But in terms of if you're looking on the pitch, I just think maybe they could look at recalling him because, you know, last couple of games, Charlie Austin is the only striker is not what you want. I mean, he sort of does an hour, doesn't he? And then he comes off and then yet they haven't got another striker to bring on it. I think when they did it against Luton, it was like sort of Willick or Chair or someone goes up front. And I mean, you look at Bon, and I know he struggled last season. He scored a lot of goals this year. And I just think when you're going for promotion, you do need all the help you can get. And if there's going to be situations where QPR are having to rely on Charlie Austin as their only striker, why not bring Bon back? And, I, you know, you said maybe that that's the last we've seen of him. I do think maybe he's earned himself another chance just to bring him back and see what he is capable of in the championship. I think he had some like personal problems last year as well, which obviously didn't help. So I don't know. I think maybe he has earned himself another another chance in the QPR show, and I'd quite like to see him see what he can do. I'd agree with you. He's, he's earned himself another chance, but I think his his 
comments he's made suggest that he's he's not really interested in in that chance. Yeah, he's, he's found the, where he wants to be. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, we've also got to keep in mind, we're, we're talking about January. I mean, we're now towards the end of November. Now, again, unless those injuries to, to Dykes and Gray are serious long-term things, and, and I don't think there's been any indication that they are, then you do then have to look at the picture and, and what, what Bond says is right. If everyone else is fit, he will be fourth choice striker. Now, there's no point in him being fourth choice striker. Um, none at all. You know, um, that's not going to benefit his career. And, and I think, again, the manager has, has, has got this right in that he sent him out to Ipswich saying that is better for his career at the moment. And potentially it may be better for, for QPR long term. But I think you know, he, he will be well aware. I mean, it won't be the first communication they've had from Macaulay Bond. I'm sure they're monitoring players that are out on loan. They've got an idea of how it's going and whether it's a step towards bringing someone back. And my feeling, as I said, is if there is a need for another striking option in January, then I think they will go out and, and bring in someone new. I don't think it will be Macaulay Bond, but... You know, maybe may, may wrong. I think as well, like, it's a case of... Sorry to interrupt. I think it's a case of while he's over there banging goals in, his value's at, at a level where you can make some money on him. Yeah. If you bring him back and he's sat on the bench, fourth, twelfth striker, then, you know, you're not going to get... If you want to sell him, you're not going to get anywhere near the money you want back. So it probably makes sense to keep him there if he's happy and scoring goals. And, you know, if they get promoted, then... You know, there's a good chance that they'll they'll splash out for him in in the summer. Not looking too lightly. I mean, I mean one thing. What well, what one thing I would. And he only scored three well goals last is, season, so you can already say he was prolific. Was 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 it three? Okay. And he, he missed, about, the stats he, he hand, missed at least good. nine or ten golden opportunities to score. So he didn't pull up any trees last year. So I can see why Warburton had him as a fourth choice striker and felt he had to bring in, you know, reinforcements in that area. But what I think one, Charlie Kilman's a better player, to be is, brutally honest. Yeah, and, and one thing I'd add, though, is, is it's a little bit similar to, if you flip this around, it's, it's a little bit similar to the situation with Charlie Austin last season when he was back at QPR on loan and doing well, scoring goals, mm. spearheading the rise up the table. Now, from a West Brom point of view at that time, you know, why, why would you be thinking about bringing him back, you, you, you wouldn't because you'd, you'd say, well, he doesn't want to be here. He wants to be there. Let's cut our losses, mm. you know, and, and free up the salary, which is what they needed to do. And I think it's a similar situation, really, um, as, as what we had from the, the, the reverse side with, with Charlie Austin last season. Mm. I agree with what you said earlier. I think it's pretty obvious if he comes back, which I think Bart Warburton probably will be inclined to leave him out there. But if he does come back, he has to play. And I think the only concern for me is maybe why I think maybe you should come back is that Andre Gray's had a lot of injury problems in his career that have been well documented. Lyndon Dykes, there's not an international break for a little while, I don't think now, but he goes away and plays three games with Scotland. And every time he comes back, he seems like he's got an injury problem that he has to miss two or three games. And then you're struggling because if Gray's out, then you've got, like I said, Charlie Austin is the only striker. And I just think when you're going for promotion, could Bond come back and give you that little bit more? But yeah, like I said, the only concern or the big concern is that maybe he does, doesn't want to come back, which is obviously a problem because if he doesn't want to be there, then I don't think QPR will, will have him there. Yeah, I think Chris Willett playing up top's done a pretty good job as well. You yeah. Know, he, the goal he scored against Luton was Macaulay Bond wouldn't have scored that goal. So I think... You know, they're not exactly struggling for goals, Rangers, are they? So I'd leave him out there. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. Remains to be seen. Uh, yeah, upcoming next for QPR is uh, Derby County. Obviously, rock bottom of the league, but not from performances, from points deductions. When you actually look at the games they've had, I think Wayne Rooney's done a pretty good job there, really, considering all the problems that they've had. He's organised them very well. I think they've got the fourth best defence in the championship. And so they can keep the goals out. And I suppose the bad news is for QPR, as we just touched on, luckily it doesn't seem to have been too much of a problem in the last couple of games. But Mark Warburton said that he's not sure if Lyndon Dykes and Andre Gray will be back for the game, which means got Charlie Austin is the only recognised um, striker again. Um, it's not, like I said, it's not been an issue so far, has it, Ian? But at some point you do kind of worry that with Gray and Dykes missing out, maybe it could sort of Derby's the sort of game where, the, where their loss could be felt. 
Yeah, I think Rangers will beat Derby. Um, I think they massive congratulations to what they've done. They're picking up four points from Bournemouth and Dutton. Fulham is no easy feat. That said, Fulham were without Mitrovic last night and various other players. So perhaps on a good night um, to play them uh, for a nil draw. Um, but I was on a Derby um, podcast this, this week and, you know, they were sort of telling me, you know, the financial issues they've got there are frightening. That's they, horrendous. The debt they're in debt for like £203 million pound and the stadium they've got is worth, you know, not even half of that. So they've got real issues, real kind of, they could go out, literally could go out of business. So, you know, the circumstances they're playing under and with, you know, point deductions on that, you know, it's, it's, it's huge, huge credit to those players for, you know, scrapping away um, and picking up, you know, <laughs> Some points to give them no points if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I think if it wasn't but, for the deduction, they'd but, be... but but I do but I do think I mean they're they're very worried about playing QBR. They think that you know the pace that Rangers have and the way they pop the ball around will, 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 will cause derby problems. Um, I didn't see the Fulham game last night, obviously, but all accounts they just put ten men behind the ball and Fulham couldn't break them down. They're playing at home, so I'll probably have to have a, try and have a go. Um, and you do find when a team is struggling right at the bottom with kind of limited kind of players they might pick up a good result they don't expect it and then you know we'll get beaten in the next game that's kind of usually how it works mm. so I fully expect Rangers to go up there and, and, and turn them over to be honest mm. What's your prediction then? I'm going to go 3-0 you know. Yeah that's a bold prediction I said Derby good defence so we'll, we'll see what see what happens I think um, another couple of injuries as well that Odebadjo might be out as well which is He's been out for a few games. I think Stephanie Hansen as well had to go off, didn't he, yesterday? So we'll have to wait and see on that one if that's anything more serious. So um, what are your thoughts on this, Ben? What's your prediction? I'm not I'm not going to go 3-0. Um, as, as you said, Dan, Derby have, have got a decent defence. And, you know, I, th I think there's a danger here. People look at the league table and obviously see where they are. But of course, as as you've said, Dan, that's, that's an artificial position. And, and in real terms, they're... I think they would be, what, about 18th, 19th um, if, if they hadn't lost the, uh, all those points. So um, I, I, I think it will be it will be a difficult game. Um, I feel the way Rangers are playing, they're, they're certainly capable of, of getting three points. Um, I always like to look at records uh, against teams and on their grounds, and, and I've never been able to fathom why, but Rangers always seem to have a better record away to Derby than at home to them. Uh, it's just always been the way. I don't know, but um, so I, I would fancy them to win, um, but I will go um, two one. I think it'd be yeah a lot a lot closer than three nil personally. Yeah, I do fancy QPR to win as well. But I think I'll probably stay like a tight one nil win. I think it could be a bit heavier for Derby if Dykes and Gray were around, but I think with Austin is the only striker. I think there is a lack of a goal threat or you know less of a goal threat than there otherwise would be. So. I think a tight one now is probably the way it's going to turn out. Um, so, yeah, thanks for watching. Hopefully we'll have Kevin Gallen back on next week. He's away in Germany this week, so he's not been able to join us, but we're open to have him back. And, uh, yeah, thanks for watching, and please subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, and give it a like. Thanks.